Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Rayma Land, Anne Blythe, and Nigel Bruce in Stairway to Heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When I was in England not so long ago, London was preparing to welcome many of the world's most famous screen stars to a precedent-shattering event, the first command performance of a motion picture. Selected for the entertainment of the king and queen and other members of the royal family was tonight's screenplay, J. Arthur Rank's presentation, Stairway to Heaven. Starred in our cast is Ray Milland, whose brilliant achievements recently won him the Screen's coveted Academy Award, co-starred with Ray are Anne Blythe and Nigel Bruce. Now I'd like to speak of another command performance, one that goes on day after day, and the star is Lux Soap. Its performance is acclaimed by American families from coast to coast, especially by lovely women who must care for their beauty just as carefully as queens, and their approval indicates that Lux Soap is, uh, well, let's say, a, a stairway to a heavenly complexion. On to our play, Universal International's release, Stairway to Heaven, starring Ray Milland as Peter Carter, Anne Blythe as June, and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Reeves, with Joseph Kearns as Conductor R34. <laughs> This is a story of two worlds. The one you know, called Earth, and another, existing only in the mind of a young pilot whose life and imagination have been violently shaped by war. It's 1945, shortly before dawn. Over the North Sea, a Lancaster bomber, riddled by shells and on fire, struggles through a dense fog toward the English coast. The pilot has just made radio contact with an air-sea rescue station. Hello? Hello down there? Hello? Can you hear me? Where are you, Lancaster? Request your position. Come in, please. Position nil. What's your name? I cannot read you. Can you see our signal? No. No, it's funny, but all of a sudden I'm thinking of a poem. Give me my scallop shell of quiet, my staff of faith to walk upon, my scrip of joy, immortal diet, my bottle of salvation, my gown of glory, hope's true gauge, and thus I'll take my pilgrimage. The Walter Raleigh wrote that, and I'd rather have written that than flown through Hitler's leg. I cannot understand you. Request your position. I can't give you my position. Instrument shot away. Crew gone too. All except Trubshaw here, my navigator. He's dead. The rest bailed out on my orders. Time 0445. Crew bailed out 0445. My station, Warrenden. Bomber Group G for George. Send them a signal, please. Warrenden. Bomber Group G, George. Are you going to try to land G, George? My name is not G, George. It's Carter. Peter D. Carter. No, I can't land. And the carriage is gone. I'm bailing out presently. What's your name? June. Well, I'm bailing out, June, but there's a catch. I don't have a parachute. Repeat, please. Hello, can you hear me? It's all right. I'd much rather jump than fry. I I hope I'm not upsetting you, June. Are you pretty? Not bad. You've got a beautiful voice. That's funny. A girl I've never seen will hear my last words. Perhaps we can do something. Let me report you. No, no, no. Just keep talking, please. I, I, I want to be alone with you, June. Where were you born? In Boston, Massachusetts. Boston? That's a place to be born in. History was made there. Are you in love with someone? No, 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 please. Don't answer that. I could love a man like you, Peter. Well, I love you, June. Because you're life. And I'm leaving you. Where do you live? Leewood House, about three miles from here. Good. I'll be a ghost and come and see you. What time will you be there? I'm on duty till six the night. Oh, this is such nonsense. Oh, it's the best sense I ever heard. It can't be helped about the parachute. What do you think the next world is like? Peter, please, 
Okay. Oh, well, I'll know soon enough. Club Shaw will probably be waiting for me. Goodbye. Goodbye, June. Hello, G. George. Hello, G. George. Sure. I have told you a dozen times, I am very busy. Do not bother me. Look, am I dead or am I not dead? Sacre bleu, yes, of course you are dead. All right, and this is heaven, isn't it? Then where is he? Where is Peter D. Carter? He's around here someplace. Look for him. I have almost 1,000 airmen to account for, and if you expect... Me... Peter D. Carter is not here, but he's supposed to be here. His name's on that list. He's either A-W-O-L, or there's been a mistake. There has not been a mistake here for 1,000 years. Then where's Carter? There was a mistake. If Peter Carter was still alive on Earth, a bell would ring. <laughs> you hear a bell? No. Therefore, no mistake has been made. And if you have any further complaints... Oh, no. Oh, no, no! Conductor R-34. Conductor R-34. Go to the recorder's office with Lieutenant Trubshaw. Report at once, please, with Lieutenant Trubshaw. Hmm? No mistake, huh? Well, R-34, what about this mess? Tiens, what can I say, monsieur? The bell rang. A mistake has been made. Who is missing? My flight commander, sir, Peter D. Carter. Well? I must have lost him in that accursed fog down there on Earth. Oh, there was a fog, all right. Real old peace super. I've been waiting for him, sir. So have I. Don't you know a thing like this must be reported to me immediately? I lost my head, monsieur recorder. Uh, not long in the service, eh? Oh, since the so-called glorious French Revolution, monsieur. I see. Natural death? I also lost my head then. Monsieur, I will go after Carter at once. It's not so simple. Hmm? Peter Carter has fallen in love. That complicates matters. He's... he's fallen in love? Peter Carter jumped from his plane, fully expecting an immediate demise. Due to some... some butterfingering up here, he did not die. But, but, but... He lost consciousness and woke up on a stretch of beach. Suddenly, he became aware of a girl coming toward him. Hey! Hello! Hello! Anything wrong? Well, I... I don't know. I... Why, you... You're June. And you're... You're Peter. Peter! Yes. And I'm not dead. I'm alive. But how did you get here? Oh, I'm so glad you're safe. What happened? I don't know. I... I just don't know. Are you hurt? Well, my head does feel a bit queer. Peter, what a cruel joke to play. But I wasn't joking. I've been crying so ever since you said goodbye to me from the plane. But don't cry, June. Don't ever cry again. Peter. Oh, darling. And that is what's been going on down there. I will proceed to Earth at once, monsieur. Explain your error to Mr. Carter and get him up here where he belongs. Oh, and uh, when you see him, give him a message for me, huh? Avec plaisir. What message? Just say, what ho? Bon. Oh, uh, Monsieur Recorder, you have a, a small idea where I might locate Monsieur Carter? Uh, wait a minute. Yes, sir? Operations, please. Yes, sir. Operations office. Whereabouts? Peter D. Carter, delinquent. Oh, yes. Lee Woodhouse, sir, in company with a Miss June Adams, an American whack. Oh. They're in the garden, sir. It seems she is off duty. That's I... enough. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, yes, quite enough. A May night, an English garden bathed in moonlight. Moonlight? But it's not night already. You will soon learn, Mr. Trubshaw, that here there is no such thing as time. And what seems to you a wink of the eye, down there may be a century. Are you still here? Oh, on my way, monsieur. All will be serene. June. Are you cold, darling? Cold? No, Peter, no. Do you smell anything? Why, no. Oh. What a beautiful night. Tell me, what did you do before the war? Good evening. Good evening. And who are you? What, the costume? What is wrong with these clothes? They are my very best. I was buried in them some hundred and fifty years ago. <clears throat> June. June, am I seeing ah, things... Ah, she is lovely, is she not? But save your breath, monsieur. The lady sees nothing, hears nothing. June! We are talking in space, you and I, not in time. Are you crazy? Who are you? We should have met at dawn, mon ami. 
Unfortunately, I missed you. Oh, I bring you a message from Monsieur Trubshaw. Trubshaw's dead. Trubshaw oh, yes, was quite dead. He says, what ho? He always says, what ho? But he's dead. Again, I say yes. And what should be the status of a man who jumps from his aircraft without a parachute? How do you know? He also should be dead. But I missed you because of your ridiculous English climate. Fogger. But what do you want now? Well, you, my friend. What for? To conduct you. Where? To heaven, of course. Oh, this is fantastic. And if I refuse to go with you... But you cannot refuse. You have overstayed already by nearly 16 hours. Uh, Earth time, that is. But, 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 but what about her, June? I'm in love with her. What is love? The feeling of a moment. I represent eternity. Look, 16 hours ago I was not in love, but now I am. Millions of people are in love. Do they protest when their time is up? No, they do not. They have no right to. Exactly. But I have. Why? Now look, it was no fault of mine that I didn't die. I've fallen in love because of your mistake. I demand an appeal. Will you please be reasonable? Appeal to whom? Well, that's your problem. Find out. Well, it's never been done, never. Then go away. Oh, you are determined to get me into the salad, aren't you? But what about the salad you've got me into? Oh. I think I will leave you for a little while. Well, that's better. A little while, I said. I shall have to report above for instructions. Good. Go on. Report. And do not fall any deeper in love. Do you hear me? I am warning you. Ah, oh, she is charming, isn't she? Au revoir, mon ami. I worked for a magazine. June. What did you say? I said I worked for a magazine. But why did you say that? <laughs> because you just asked me what I did before the war. Oh, yes. Yes, I did. June, what's the matter with me? Such an, an odd thing happened while you were asleep. Or oh, did it? I haven't been asleep. Then you heard us talking? Why, no. Who was here to talk to? They sent somebody. They? June, do I look cracked? <laughs> Not to me, darling. Are you? Look, there was a dense fog at dawn this morning. That's right, isn't it? You know there was. And I did bail out without a parachute. So how can I be alive? Darling, we talked about it all day. We don't know what happened. It doesn't make sense. And I'm in love with you. That doesn't make much sense either, but I am. But that character, he insists I should be dead. What character? Well, he's French with short pants and lace. They, they sent him out after me. He said he'd missed me before because of the fog. Bad luck for them. Good luck for me. I told him I was going to appeal. Now, he's gone off to get instructions. It's not my fault I'm not dead. It's not my fault that I found you and, and fell in love with you. It... Oh. Peter. Oh, my head again. This awful headache. June. June, you are there, aren't you? Peter, of course I'm here. Just now, for a second, I thought I'd lost you. What is it, darling? What is it? Dr. Reeves, who? Oh, June. Good morning. What? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come right over now, if you like. I'll be delighted to see you. Well, that's the whole story, Dr. Reeves. I know it sounds ridiculous, but just... No, where's this Peter chap now? In the village at the inn. Why hasn't he rejoined his station? Because I was hoping so that you might help him, or at least see him. You've told me about cases like this. No, no, not like this, because nothing ever happened like this. I mean... Well, I've done a lot of work in neurology, yes, but that doesn't alter the fact that Peter Carter is the property of the Air Force. He's not property. He's a person, a very fine person. I don't want just anyone mauling him about and asking him questions. I want you. I'm sure the RAF would say that. I know exactly what they'd say. I had a talk with Carter's commanding officer just after you phoned me. The medical officer, too. Luckily, he'd heard of me. Oh, he said he had, anyhow. You mean, then, they won't make Peter? I mean that I've arranged a week's furlough. Oh, Dr. Reeves. So he... he believes that he bailed out without a parachute, eh? Yes. And he has a hallucination. This 18th century Frenchman, you told him that he was talking rubbish? No. Good girl. Look here. You still have that recreation hall at Lee Wood House? Yes. Well, supposing I meet you and Carter there, say, about tea time. I'll be off duty till five. Well, I'd better see your CO as well. Uh, I'll want you round for a while, June. Oh, don't mind me. Just go on with your game. Dr. Reeves. So he's a chess player, is he? <laughs> 
Any good? <laughs> He'll do. Squadron leader Carter, Dr. Reed. How do you do? How do you do? Well, I've, I've told him, Doctor, about you. Good. Do you mind if I ask a lot of stupid questions, Carter? No, I wish you would. These visions that you've had, hallucinations, ever had them before? No, never. What were you in civilian life? Well, I taught at Oxford European history. Parents alive? My mother. What was the cause of your father's death? Same as mine. Brain? No, war, 1917. How long have you been in? Since 41. You must have had a good many missions. 67. About these headaches. Headaches? Oh, I know you get them. I know you've had them for some time. And I know that you've told nobody about them. Especially your medical officer. Right? What else do you know? I know about your eyes. You know a great deal. I'd like to know more. Well, the headache started about six months ago. Here, mostly. Frontal and temporal. Do you ever get a bang on the head? Well, dropped as a baby, no doubt. I don't remember. Mind if I try something? Look straight ahead. Like this? Yes. What are you looking at? Is that girl down there at the piano. She's got nice legs. <laughs> yes, very. Now, don't you take your eyes off her. Oh, this is going to be easy. Now, without moving your eyes, what can you see on the extreme right? Fireplace. In the center? Girl with legs. Extreme left? Windows. Curtains? Yes. What color? Dark red. Good. Well, that's all of that. Now then, you've... Uh, you've seen something. Someone. Clearly? As clearly as I see you. Now, don't you be annoyed with this question. It may sound rather silly, but... Have you imagined recently that you've smelt something that couldn't possibly be there? How did you know? I didn't. It was shot in the dark. You noticed that odor at the same time you saw this heavenly messenger, this conductor fuller, this, uh, this Frenchman. Yes. Onions. Fried onions. <laughs> well, <laughs> you asked me. This messenger hasn't turned up uh, again, has he? No, but he will. Oh, uh, when? I don't know. Peter's launched an appeal, Doctor. Against what? Against dying. That's the spirit. Now, don't you give in. I won't. Well, that's about all for now, except that you're to stay at my house for a few days. Do you mind? Not at all, but uh, what about my CO? His orders, too, and mine as well. I want you to... Well, I want to be around when this Frenchman calls on you again. You're on your own till seven tonight. Oh, you... you you're to come, too, June. Uh, dinner at seven. He's still asleep, Doctor. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Well, he'll sleep for at least another hour. How do you know? I gave him a pill. But what if the... If the Frenchman comes again, I left a bell at the side of Peter's chair. A bell? If he has a visitor, Peter's going to ring the bell, if he can. Now, how about another game of pinochle? Sure, if you'd like. Don't you worry about him, June. He'll... he'll... June! June, Dr. Reeves, quickly! <laughs> In a moment, we'll return with Stairway to Heaven. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. I've got two pieces of news tonight, Mr. Keeley. One's about James Mason's latest picture, The Upturned Glass, a J. Arthur Rank presentation. And the other's the new bath-sized Lux toilet uh, Tell us about the out. picture first, Libby. I understand Universal International has a most unusual story of love and violence in The Upturned Glass. Oh, it's a thriller, all right. James Mason plays a famous surgeon, and Pamela Colino and Rosamond John are rivals for his affections in the picture, which he produced with Sidney Bach. Two exceptionally fine actresses. Yes, and two very glamorous leading ladies for James Mason. Pamela Colino is a famous brunette beauty, and Rosamond John a lovely ash blonde. And what a complexion, Mr. Kennedy. The real peaches and cream kind. A real Lux complexion, I think? Yes, Rosamond depends on Lux toilet soap care. When she was over from England recently, she said it was a joy to be able to get all she wanted of her favorite beauty soap. Also, to find an unlimited supply of hot water. After fuel rationing abroad, that seemed almost too good to be true. I should think so. Well, now she can enjoy a beauty bath that's just about tops in luxury. Because she'll be using the brand new bath size Lux toilet soap. Yes, Mr. Kennedy. And here's our big news of the evening. Now, this handsome new bath-sized Lux toilet soap is available to women everywhere. And what a really super bath soap it is, Libby. Well, screen stars certainly think so. 
They tell me the new bath size Lux toilet soap is wonderful. And I'm sure everyone who uses it will agree. Only the size is different. The same familiar Lux toilet soap wrapper, the same fine white cake. And the same delightful fragrance. Yes, the new bath size cake is the same high quality Lux toilet soap, except that the size is just right for truly luxurious bathing. So here's a tip for clever shoppers tomorrow. Look for the new bath size Lux toilet soap. Let the whole family enjoy this convenient big new cake. It makes your daily Lux toilet soap bath more refreshing, more luxurious than ever. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Presenting Act Two of Stairway to Heaven, starring Ray Milland as Peter Cotter, Anne Blythe as June, and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Reeves. A few moments ago, uh, Earth time that is, June and Dr. Reeves sat talking in the doctor's living room. Nearby in the library, Peter Carter was asleep on a couch. At his side was a small bell. Then, suddenly, Peter was not alone in the library. Monsieur. Monsieur Carter. <clears throat> Monsieur, if you please. <clears throat> what? Who? Oh. Oh, you're back. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, very well. Ring the bell. You see? Nothing happened. The bell does not ring. Ah, a book. Oh, a book of chess. I was reading it just before I fell asleep. Alicine's hundred best games. I must look this over. Stop stalling. Hmm? What about my appeal? Oh, yes. Well, it's been granted. Thank you. The trial will be a full dress affair. Oh, très chic. Everyone will be there. You have two days in which to prepare your case. Wonderful. Oh, don't be so happy. The prosecuting counsel, the one who will insist that you leave this little world of yours... Well? Abraham Farland. Come again? Abraham Farland. Never heard of him. A man from Boston. I've never been in Boston. Abraham Farland died in Boston in 1775. Oh? Exactly. The American War of Independence. Was Farland killed? Yes, by a British bullet. Ah, and he may be prejudiced, huh? What did they say? Oh, yes. He hates your guts. He hates the guts of every Englishman, and particularly hates you for being involved with such a nice girl from Boston, Massachusetts. All right, I'll appeal against him. Impossible. After all, we had to pick the best man. The honor of my whole department is at stake. What you have to do is choose a good man for yourself. As my lawyer. Precisely. Who? Oh, anybody who has ever lived upon Earth. All at your disposal. <laughs> well, you could even choose me. <laughs> that would suit you just fine, wouldn't it? Oh, no. no I didn't think so. Well, you can choose Socrates, William Pitt, Henry VIII. What about Madame du Berry? She knows all about love. We're rather a one-track mind. No, I, I, I'll have to think it over. Oh. By the way, this book on chess, I would like to borrow it. It's not mine. It belongs to the doctor. Doctors? <laughs> they give me a great deal of trouble in my job. Oh, well, you think it over. I will be back, monsieur. June! June, Dr. Reeves, quickly! What is the Peter? The French no, he's gone. But he was here. The bell, I couldn't ring it until... Peter. Oh, Peter, you're all right. Yes. Yes, I think so. Hold oh, still, hold still, Peter. Now, let me look at your eyes. Look up, towards the ceiling. You can talk if you want to. So he just left, eh? Yes. I hope you didn't give in to anything. No. Stay put, Elba. I'll be right back. June, I've good news. What, darling, what? I've won the appeal. The trial's in two days. Oh, darling. Peter, tell me, did you smell anything? Yes. Same as before? Fried onions. Now, I I want you to drink this. Any headache? Oh, a beauty. You can tell me what the Frenchman said tomorrow. But I want to talk. He said that... Good heavens, it's gone. What's gone? What book was I reading before I went to sleep? That book of mine on chess? Alakine's Hundred Best Games. Yes. I put it right here. You sure? Absolutely certain. What a nerve. A bit cool. Now, how about getting back to sleep? But about my counselor, the trial. Oh, I don't think you believe a word I say. Peter. My dear friend, here on earth, I'm your defending counsel. And as your counsel, I believe everything you tell me. June. June, I don't want to leave you. Why should you leave me, darling? Everything will be all right. If I can only get a good counsel. Of course you will. It's so important. I. I don't want to lose you, June. I won't let you go, Peter. No one can take you from me. I won't let you go. I won't let you go. Well, he's 
Doctor. He's sleeping again, June. Will he have more hallucinations? Yes, but I think he'll be all right. He's not going mad, then. His brain's not affected. Of course it's affected. He's having a series of highly organized hallucinations, comparable to an experience of, of actual life, a combination of vision, of hearing, and of an idea. To a neurologist, that points to a pressure on the brain. That's why Peter's sense of smell has been affected. How did he survive the jump from his plane? I don't know. But right now, the main thing is for him to win his case at the trial. You're serious? Perfectly serious. But suppose he loses. Oh, that's absurd. Well, if we see that he's losing or we think that he's going to lose, we'll find out the reason why he survived his jump. Or we'll invent one. We'll have a couple of drinks, you and I, and invent the greatest lie in medical history. Meanwhile... Yes? Peter will have to be operated on. When? Right away. I'll see his RAF medical officer in the morning. We can't wait for the trial, June. As you said, he may lose. We don't dare wait any longer, Dr. McEwen. Deterioration all around. We ought to operate tonight. But we're swamped here. Are you sure of your diagnosis? Uh, absolutely certain. I showed you the x-rays yesterday. The ocular reports. Those highly organized hallucinations coupled with a sense of smell. Everything points to arachnoid adhesions involving the olfactory nerve. But uh, I'm no surgeon. Who do you have here? Edwin Lyser. Lyser, fine. That's good, good, good. But I don't see how we can manage tonight. There's no crisis in a thing like this. Any day would do. There is a crisis. And I'm afraid. Insanity? Yes. Why? Well, I told you of that trial that Carter keeps talking about. Well, as far as he's concerned, that trial is fixed for tonight. And he hasn't found anyone to defend him yet. He really believes all this. Intensely. The boy's got a fine mind, McCure, and a fine mind. That's part of our trouble. Too good a mind. A weak mind isn't strong enough to hurt itself. Yes, stupidity has saved many a man from going mad. Well, Carter's had several talks with his heavenly messenger, that Frenchman. Hallucinations, of course. But you never saw such an imagination. I, uh... I don't quite follow. Well, nothing that Carter invents is entirely fantastic. It's invention, but it's a logical invention. He's convinced that he'll die if he loses his case tonight. And that's why I say that we've got to operate tonight. Well, it's no shaking your head like that. I'm a... sorry, but I... Yes? Who? Oh, one moment, please. It's you, Dr. Reed. The girl. Hello? It's Peter, Doctor. He's worse. I don't know what's happened. An attack or something. We were sitting here in your library, and all of a sudden, he just stopped. He just sat staring out at the rain, staring into space as if he... Oh, please, come. I'll be right there, June. Peter. Peter, darling, you're far off somewhere. Come back. Come back, Peter, come back. I do not understand you at all, monsieur. I give you the right to choose as your counsel anyone who ever lived on Earth, and yet you tell me you cannot make up your mind. I can't. But may I remind you, the trial is but a few of your hours off. Now look there. Shelf after shelf of books about famous men. There is Lincoln. What about Abraham Lincoln? No, it's hardly fair to drag him in, though I don't think he'd be prejudiced. Plato. Nobody knew more about reasoning than Plato. He was 81 when he died. He might be too old to think love important. Uh, perhaps you are right. Now, if he'd been French, sure. Uh... Richelieu, for example, irresistible at 80. No, I never liked Richelieu and the Three Musketeers. Voltaire? No. Well, then who do you want? Look, it sounds fine to have all these great men to choose from, but what do they know about our problems today? True, very little. Besides, it should be an Englishman. Nobody famous, but, but somebody with his head screwed on all right. Now, this Abram Farland, was he a famous man? A school teacher. You see? Anyway... Why are you so interested in getting me a counsel? I am interested only in getting you where you belong in heaven. Oh, Peter, now, come with me now. No. If you do, you will have nothing to worry about. No trial, no vexations, no pain. See over there, Peter. A great, magnificent stairway. Yes. It will take us there, Peter. It is the stairway to heaven. No. Oh, come, Peter, come. No. No, I don't have to go yet. I have your word. I, I can appeal. I'm leaving you, Frenchman. I'm getting out of space and back to Earth. Back before it's too late. Peter! No, come back. Come back here. Come back. Come back. Come back, Peter. Come back, darling. Peter. Oh, Peter. June. June, he almost got me. June. June. 
Doctor. He'll come round in a moment. June, Peter's got to go to the hospital tonight. Phone Dr. McEwen. Tell him that I say it's a matter of life and death. Yes, Doctor. Oh, better send a telegram to his mother and sisters. You know where? Yes. That's all. Hello, Peter. Where's June? He's phoning. She'll be back in a moment. He almost got me. I know. He's such a crafty beggar. I only got away by the skin of my teeth. Now, look here. Don't let anybody fool you into giving up this appeal. You've been promised a fair trial. Don't give in to anybody. But I haven't the counsel. We'll find the right man. They might appoint some stew. Nonsense. Or let it go by default. I tell you, we'll find somebody. They can't start until we do. Nobody famous. Well, how about... Doctor. Coming. I couldn't reach the hospital. The operator says it's the storm. I'll take your car. No, no, no. You're more valuable here. I'll go. Now go into him. Don't allow him to despair, June. His life is in your hands. Coming. Miss Adams? Yes? I'm Dr. McEwen from the hospital. There's been an accident. Accident? Dr. Reed. He was on his way to see you. I did see him. Yes, they brought him in. His car skidded over off the road. Dr. Reeves is dead. Oh, no. He told me about Captain Carter. Now, we're taking him to the hospital right away. He'll be in good hands. I'll tell Peter. What's happened, June? Where's Dr. Reeves? He's... He's gone ahead, Peter. He's had an accident, hasn't he? Yes, a bad accident. Is he dead? Yes, he's dead. Come, darling. Dr. McEwen's waiting. Well, Dr. Reeds, I believe. Yes? Welcome. Thank you. Oh, uh, permit me to return your book on chess. Oh. Ah, ha, ha. So it's you. And how is dear Peter? He has a fighting chance. Oh, ho. Where are you taking me? Up the stairway. We will have to skip several of the preliminaries. I am taking you at once to the recorder. He is very anxious to see you, Doctor. Come in, please. Monsieur Recorder, Dr. Frank Reeves. Ah, Doctor. Uh, you are familiar with the case of Peter Carter? I am. He has just chosen you to be his counsel. I was hoping he would. You have very little time in which to prepare your case. They tell me that seats in the courtroom are already at a premium. Peter's in the hospital now? Yes, they've already started the brain operation. I should like to see my client immediately. Conductor, take Dr. Reeves to the operating room. Respiration shallow and erratic, Dr. Leiser. Pulse 88. Hello, Peter. Hello, Doctor. Where's June? She's waiting, Peter, out in the corridor. They're operating on me, aren't they? How's it going? Well, oh, Dr. Lees is a great surgeon, Peter. Neat, very neat indeed. I, I like his work. Good. About me, Peter, I'm very flattered that you've made me your counsel. Are you sure that I'm the best man? Oh, quite sure. But I'm no lawyer, and if Abraham Farland gets into politics, I'm sunk. Well, who isn't? Come on, Doctor, you must have something. A little common sense, perhaps. Well, if it's as rare up there as it is down here, a little will do me fine. I need evidence, Peter. June's all the evidence I need. I've fallen in love with her. Her accent is foreign, but it sounds sweet to me. We were born thousands of miles apart, yet we were made for each other. Conductor, may I kiss her? You know, just in case. Oh, yes. Kiss her, go on. But she will not know it. Don't matter. This I want to see. Come, Doctor, the corridor. I think they'd rather be alone. But we cannot let him out of our sight. Look so. Huh. He kisses her. Oh, are you English? What is the good of kissing a girl if she cannot feel it? You, darling. You see, Doctor? She just sits in her chair in the corridor. She's crying. Ah, yes, the lady weeps. You want evidence, Doctor? There it is. Her tears. Don't cry, darling. If I could only... Take one of her tears. But you can. You can do as you wish. But how can you take a tear into heaven? Permit me. The rose in my buttonhole. I touch the rose to her cheek. So. And like a pearl of dew upon the petal lies a single mortal tear. The only bit of real evidence that we have. Well, come. We get out of here now. Monsieur Recorder, we are ready. 
the case of Peter Carter versus Heaven will now be heard. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Stairway to Heaven. It's always a pleasure to welcome to this program an ambitious young player making a success in Hollywood. Our guest tonight is blonde, green-eyed Neela Hart. Didn't I see you at Universal International the other day, Neela? Yes, Mr. Keeley. It was on the set for the last moment, remember? Oh, of course. It must have been fascinating for you to watch Susan Hayward and Robert Cummings do justice to those highly dramatic scenes. Oh, it certainly was, Mr. Keeley. Isn't this an unusual role for Robert Cummings? Yes, Bob has one of the most serious roles of his career in the lost moment. It's a thrilling story, full of eerie atmosphere and suspense. And Susan Haywood looks more beautiful than ever. Don't you agree, Mr. Kennedy? Ah, she's lovely indeed. And that gorgeous red hair of hers just sets off a radiant luxe complexion. <laughs> I know, Mr. Kennedy, that Susan Haywood is a luxe girl. She told me so herself. And speaking of Hollywood beauty soap... Aren't you going to tell our audience the news about Lux soap you told me before the broadcast? It's good news for every woman who uses Lux toilet soap. Now, this fine white soap is available in a brand new bath size. A handsome larger cake. Just the right size for a really luxurious beauty bath. Same wonderful perfume, I hope. Right. Just as fragrant, just as white. In the same familiar wrapper. Only the size is different. Women everywhere are going to love it. In fact, here's what they're saying about it. A screen star. I'm delighted to have my favorite Lux toilet soap in this new bath size. The same lovely fragrance, the same creamy lather that makes my daily bath such a joy. A housewife. My whole family tells me they're enjoying this new bath size cake. It's so luxurious. A business girl. I just love the new bath size Lux toilet soap. Lots of quick, rich lather that leaves my skin smoother, really fresh and sweet. Now everyone can enjoy this new luxury bath. Ask for the big new bath size Lux toilet soap tomorrow. It comes in the same sampler wrapper, but in a handsome larger cake that makes your daily Lux toilet soap beauty bath more delightful, more refreshing than ever. Your dealer has the new bath size Lux toilet soap now. Mr. Keeley returns to the microphone. Act three of Stairway to Heaven, starring Ray Milland as Peter, Anne Blythe as June, and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Reed. In the operating room of an army hospital, doctors and nurses labor over a mortal mechanism called Peter Carter. But success or failure seems to lie in hands other than theirs. Far off in space, a celestial court has come to order. Ladies and gentlemen of the universe, due to uh, negligence by our Department of Admissions, Peter Carter is in the embarrassing position of dangling between heaven and earth. Here and now, we must decide either to pull him up or grant an extension of his term on earth. The jury will take their places, please. Our counsel's ready. Abraham Farland. All ready, Your Honor. Dr. Reeves. Quite ready, Your Honor. Prosecution has the floor, Mr. Farland. Your Honor, members of the jury and fellow spirits. Peter Carter, an Englishman, should have died on the 2nd of May, 1945, at 10 after 5 of the clock, British double summertime. Moreover, when summoned to report some 16 hours later, the defendant refused to accompany the authorized conductor. For what reasons, please? He claims that in the time which he had borrowed from us, he accumulated new responsibilities of an allegedly important and permanent nature. That in those few hours, a young lady of good American stock had fallen in love with him. Are we to believe this? That in those 16 borrowed hours... My Lord, uh, I object to the word borrowed. My client was given the 16 hours in question. Sustained. Nevertheless, are we to believe that Peter Carter, Englishman, 
is in love with this young lady of good American stock, and equally important, that she is in love with him. Well, why stress their nationalities, Mr. Farland? For good reason. We are talking of love, sir. It can happen, you know, between an Englishman and an American girl. My point is that when, in the course of human events, our men and women came to your little island as allies, it was not to become your prisoners. May I remind you, sir, that we are living in the 20th century and not the 18th. And may I remind you, sir, we are not living at all? <laughs> uh, you've, uh, you've got me there, Mr. Farland. I beg your pardon. Thank you. But I am up to date, Dr. Reeves. Oh, I've been watching you English from upstairs here. Your politics, your busyness. Is Peter D. Carter what you would call a good Englishman? Yes, sir. I thought so. A considerable handicap, is it not? My lord, may I ask where Mr. Father's, Mr. Farland's father was born? Entirely irrelevant. Could it possibly have been in England? My father left England, sir, because he didn't like it. Would he have liked it today? Well, I have here a radio. Let me turn it on. Listen, everyone. Listen to the England of today. Well, here we are at the cricket match, ladies and gentlemen. The voice and of England in 1945. Like now. It's stopped raining and play has been resumed. Oh, there's a fine crowd and we're all doffing our max and umbrellas now and settling down to enjoy this rousing sport, which to people all over the world is perhaps more typically English than anything else. Do you admit, That's sir, that this is an English boy? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, indeed. Who's played a delightful forcing shot off I Miller. think we've heard enough. May I turn on the radio now, sir? If Let's hear wish. the voice of America in 1945. If you wish, sir. Why, that can't be American. What is that savagery, sir? I don't understand it at all. Neither do I. I simply suggest that what may be typically British or typically American has nothing to do with Peter Carter or with June Adams. Ah, yes. June Adams. A lovely, vibrant American girl. Members of the jury, I ask you, should the swift tempo of her promising young life be slowed to the crawl of a match at cricket? Or her accustomed native comfort, outraged by England's warm drinks, cold rooms, drafty windows, and faulty plumbing? At this moment, Mr. Farland, two million houses in England have no windows at all. My lord, I submit that this court is concerned with the life and death of Peter Carter, and not with past history or present plumbing. But Peter Carter's character, sir, like every other human being, has been formed by circumstances, by a chain of circumstances. As Benjamin Franklin once said, a kingdom was lost all for the want of a horseshoe nail. You've heard of Benjamin Franklin? And I beg you, in George Washington's words, labor to keep alive in your breast that it'll spark a celestial fire called conscience. Are you insinuating that something is wrong with my conscience? Not at all. I'm proclaiming it. You're trying to prejudice the jury against Englishmen. I don't need to prejudice the jury, sir. They're already prejudiced. You can't pick a jury that isn't. Look at these 12 good men. First, you see Jean-Marie Barrow, a Frenchman. Has any century passed without war between France and England? Next is Gregarious Bonzier from the Transvaal. The Boer War, Dr. Reeves. Remember? Chang Jimin is Chinese. Don't forget England's attack on China in 1857, occupying Peking. And you, sir? Balatash Baital from Burma. Think of Burma, Dr. Reeves. And you? James Monaghan, Ireland. Choose a new jury anyway, Dr. Reeves. It must always be prejudiced against England. My lord, I challenge the jury and I request that a new one be chosen. From where, Dr. Reeves? Anywhere except England. Why not from England? Where else have the rights of the individual been held so high? In America, sir, where these rights are held inalienable. A man can see farther from the top of Boston State House and more worth seeing than from all the pyramids and turrets the world over. America, sir is the only place where a man is full grown. Then I ask for a jury of Americans. And if there is one who fought in the Revolutionary War, then I want another who fought shoulder to shoulder against our common enemy in this century. And if one has a mind that can only think back 170 years, I want another who thinks 170 years ahead. Do you agree, Mr. Farland? I would welcome such a jury, Your Honor. Court's adjourned while we find a new jury. The new juror 
members will continue to introduce themselves to the court. Francois Dupont, American citizen. Peter Van de Eyck, American citizen. Jim Wong, American citizen. Jefferson Lincoln Brown, American citizen. Patrick Aloysius Mahoney, American citizen. The jury will be seated. Mr. Farland? Apparently, Dr. Reeves has wasted the court's time. Search where you will. Humanity rises to indict England. You may proceed, Dr. Reeves. Gentlemen of the jury, here in my hand, I hold a single rose. And in this rose lies my entire case. And what is my case? I agree with Mr. Farland. Has Peter Carter fallen in love during the allotted extra... Borrow, Dr. Reeves. ...in the disputed extra 16 hours? Or has he not? Now, two young people who never would have met but for a mistake up here are being penalized for falling in love. On the petal of this rose is a tear. And in that tear are love and truth and friendship. Those qualities alone can build a new world today and a better world tomorrow. That is my entire case. And upon it, I demand that Peter Carter shall live. Mr. Farland? No questions. Your Honor. You are the foreman of the jury? I am. And we feel that the defendant and the girl should be given a chance to be heard. Is that permissible? It can be arranged. Where are they, Conductor? Uh, Peter Carter is on an operating table in an army hospital near Newcastle. The young woman is also there, waiting in the corridor. The jury feels that hearing them would help establish a better understanding of conditions. In that event, the jury will go downstairs. Lead the way, Conductor. There is Peter Carter, Monsieur, on the operating table. The jury will stand around, please. Uh, my diagnosis is right. Fine vascular meningeal adhesions, binding the optic nerve to the brain. We are not here to discuss adhesions, Dr. Reeves, but uh, to question Peter Carter. Similar uh, tissue in the, in the key. Uh, let me tell you about my operation, Doctor. I summon forth Peter D. Carter. Oh, dear. Hello, Peter. Hello, Doctor. How's the operation going? Fine. You couldn't be in better hands. There's quite a draft in my head. Peter Carter, tell the jury here whether or not you attempted to influence the emotions of that young American girl out there in the corridor. June and I fell in love before we ever met. You claim you love her. I do love her. Can you prove it? If you give me time, sir, 50 years will do. But can you prove it? Well, can a starving man prove he's hungry except by eating? Would you die for her? I would, ah. but I'd rather live. Young devil. <coughs> Pardon the expression, my lord. Good work, Peter. Good work. Your witness, Dr. Reeves. No questions. Conductor, is the young lady available? She sleeps, monsieur. Ah, she sleeps. The jury will kindly note that. I put her to sleep. Indeed, why? Oh, to enable you to call her spirit, monsieur. The jury will please note that. I do call her, Your Honor. Very well. Miss June Adams. June. Don't interrupt, Peter. Miss Adams, you've been called in the case of Peter Carter as a witness for the prosecution. Where were you born, my child? In Boston, sir. Do you know this man? I think so. You think so? I met him only a few days ago. Then how do you think you can love him? But I do love him. Nonsense, lad. Object. Counsel must withdraw the word nonsense. But Mr. Farland's right, Doctor. There's no sense in love. Wisdom still flowers in Boston, I see. Can you prove that you love him? How can I? Would you be willing to die for him? Yes. Would you take his place in the balance sheet? Yes. Don't believe her. Stand aside, sir. There's no right to ask her that. How dare you tell me what I might ask? Peter, you must obey. Tell of all the dirty tricks. This is contempt of court. I'll have you committed. Commit away. June, don't answer any more questions. Do you realize that by this attitude you've forfeited any chance of winning your case? All right. Then I lose. But you're not going to get June as well. Your witness, Dr. Reeves. June, you know me well. You trust me? Of course I do. Then listen. Because of what you've just said, it is absolutely necessary that you take Peter's place in the other world. Have you gone mad? If you really love him, June, come with me to that stairway over there. It leads to heaven. You are mad. It's the only way to prove your love, June. I do love him. You won't go. My lord, I must ask the court to restrain my client. Restrain him, bailiff. Come, my dear. June. <laughs> no, no. Goodbye, Peter. Goodbye, darling. <sighs> she is dying for him. For love. So typically French, so... Look, 
The stairs. The stairs have disappeared. The stairs have disappeared. Unprecedented. Never has this happened before. June. They're coming back. Do you know what this means? A greater hand than ours has sent her back. But the universe, the law, the law of the universe. It clearly stipulates that... I know, Mr. Fallon. In the universe, nothing is stronger than the law. But on Earth, nothing is stronger than love. June, June. I would die for you, darling, I would. Peter, forgive me, it was a long shot to take, but I, I had to take it. It has been clearly established that June loves Peter and Peter loves June. As Sir Walter Scott is always saying, love rules the court, the game, the grove, and men below and saints above. For love is heaven, and heaven is love. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, has the uh, jury considered a verdict? Case for the defendant, Your Honor. Bravo! Appeal sustained, Mr. Carter. Thank you, sir. There now remains the new date on Peter Carter's file. I'll write it down. Will, uh, will counsels approve it, please? Satisfactory, Dr. Reeves? Very generous, my lord. Isn't that a little too much, Your Honor? Uh, <clears throat> I agree. Then let's go back to where we belong. Dear me, I hope this won't establish a precedent. All right, nurse, the patient may be removed to his room now. Congratulations, Dr. Lyons. A wonderful piece of work. Mm, he'll be all right. Somehow I feel very sure of that. Peter. Oh, no, not you again. But the book, the book on chess. I'm returning it now to Dr. Reeves' library. Oh, what a pity I shall have to wait so long to play chess with you. Well, I can't say I'm sorry. Ah, in time, my friend. Au revoir, Peter. Oh, uh... She's waiting for you in your room. Waiting for me. 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 Peter. Hello, June. Hello, darling. We won. I know, darling. I know. We leave June and Peter on the threshold of a well-won heaven on earth and bring our stars back for a well-earned curtain call. Ray Milan, Dan Blythe, and Nigel Bruce, who made Stairway to Heaven a memorable landmark in this theater. Ray, we're happy we got you back from overseas in time for this performance. Well, I'd ha have hated to miss it, Bill. By now, you must be Hollywood's most traveled actor, Ray. Well, how many times have you been overseas and back, Ray? Well, this last trip makes it about 31. Ooh. Well, in other words, Paramount is more than justified in casting you as the gypsy type in your latest picture, Golden Earrings. Well, it takes Marlena Dietrich to bring out the gypsy. <laughs> well, aren't you, uh... <laughs> <laughs> aren't you, aren't you married, Ray? Yes, and so are you, Nigel. Yes, but still, yes. we can bring out the gypsy. Yes, we can still bring out the gypsy. Your trip before this last one was to be at the command performance of tonight's screenplay, wasn't it, Ray? Yes, that's right. About seven of us went over from this country. Well, Anne here recently made a command appearance at the White House, where Washington society admired what I'm sure must be a Lux complexion. It is indeed, Bill. Like everyone I know in pictures, Lux soap is my favorite beauty aid. And our audience will have another chance to applaud the results when they see you with Charles Boyer in Universal International's production, Mortal Coils. What are you doing on Lux next Monday night, Bill? A play that will keep our audience on the edges of their seats. It's Universal International's romantic drama of intrigue, Singapore, with two of Hollywood's outstanding stars. The same stars as the picture? Yes, Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner. In an action-packed story of suspense and mystery, against the glamorous background of the Orient. Singapore should make a thrilling evening for your listeners, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks all three of you for a wonderful performance. Before I say good night, I'd like to express our pleasure at having with us in the front rows of this theater a hundred representatives of the United States Navy from the aircraft carrier Boxer. We take this opportunity on Navy Day to salute these welcome ambassadors of the greatest and most respected naval force on Earth. 
Victors in War and Guardians in Peace. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner in Singapore. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. All over the world, the supply of fats and oils is critically low. One of the finest jobs ever done by American housewives has been in saving used fats. Since 1942, over 800 million pounds have been salvaged. But the need is still great. That's why your government asks you to continue to save and turn in all used kitchen fats. They'll help industry in making the essential everyday product we all need and use. Your dealer will pay you for every pound you turn in. So keep on saving used kitchen fats. Nigel Bruce will soon be seen in The Exile, Universal International release starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Heard in our cast tonight were William Johnstone as Abraham Farland, Alan Reed as the recorder, and Ben Wright, Carl Harbord, Herbert Rawlinson, Charles Lung, George Sorrell, June Whitley, Bernard Phillips, Edward Marr, Paul Marion, and Alan Lockwood. Our music was directed by Louis Silver. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Singapore with Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner. For cakes that are better four ways, try Spry. Made the Spry way, cakes are lighter, finer textured, richer flavored, stay fresh longer, moist and velvety down to the last luscious piece. Spry is the shortening with the special cake-making secret. Rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Singapore with Fred McMurray and Ava Gardner. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>